welcome in today's McKinsey webinar, Five Keys to Unlocking Growth in Marketing's Golden Age. I'm Bar Seitz, Senior Editor of McKinsey's Marketing and Sales and Digital Practices, and I'll be moderating today's event. I'm delighted to introduce our presenters. Jonathan Gordon is a partner in the New York office and co-leader of the Marketing and Brand Strategy Practice. Jesko Perry is a partner in our Dusseldorf office and the global knowledge leader of the marketing and sales practice. They are also the authors of the recently published article, The Dawn of Marketing's Golden Age, which is the basis of our webinar today. Now, we want to make this session as much of a discussion as possible as is possible in this format. So please send in your questions, and we'll get to as many of them as possible over the course of the webinar. So as a reminder, you can submit your questions by clicking the Q&A tab on your screen, typing in your question in the space provided, and clicking Send. So OK, I know nobody signed up to this webinar to listen to me. So Jonathan, I'm going to hand it over to you. Can you please kick us off? Thank you, Barr. Um, and uh, welcome to everyone who's um, dialed in for the webinar. Um, this is a topic that we are just incredibly passionate about. Uh, by way of intro, let me share a little bit of my own journey on this. Um, I won't say when exactly, but when I started as a brand manager, we were certainly in the last stages of the prior golden age of marketing. Back then, I experienced firsthand the impact that marketing can have on the business. And I honestly have believed in the power of marketing ever since then. In the following decades, marketing has been under quite a lot of pressure. There has been continued challenges about the true efficacy of marketing, a growing tendency to treat marketing as a cost to be contained, and even within the function, challenges posed by dealing with the increasing proliferation within the marketing mix. But I had a light bulb moment about a year and a half ago when I was talking to a chief marketing officer. Um, in this particular company, the CEO had set a challenge. How was marketing going to drive growth for the corporation? This is a question, honestly, that Yesco, myself, and many of our colleagues have found ourselves in um, and a conversation over the last uh, year and a half since. Growth is now firmly on the agenda in many companies, and marketing is being asked to step up. So why do we think this means we're at the dawn of a new golden age of marketing? Let's briefly touch on the prior golden age of marketing. This was characterized by amazing creativity, um, mass reach through television, and a series of home run campaigns that built businesses for their brands and have become part of advertising history. Examples like, I'd like to buy the world a Coke, American Express, don't leave home without it, and British Airways, the world's favorite airline. The world we find ourselves in today is much different, and there really are staggering changes. These are the stats I'm going to use today. Facebook has over 750 million mobile users who access the social network between 10 and 20 times per day. iPhones, on average, download 48 apps per second. There's one Twitter account added every 11 seconds. Teenagers are sending over 100 texts per day. And interestingly, about one in six couples in the US are meeting online. And frankly, even by next week, even these stats are going to feel out of date. Now, obviously, this new world offers, offers staggering possibilities for marketers, but it's not only that. These new approaches all come with data attached. And now more than ever, is it possible to isolate what marketing is working and what marketing is not? And in our experience, when marketers can demonstrate that their marketing drives growth, this became, becomes a game changer for the function. And that is fundamentally why we believe we're at the dawn of a new golden age of marketing. When marketing proves it works, it gets the funding, and it leads the growth agenda. Obviously, all of you know marketing is more than about data and proving itself. We think there are five elements, and conveniently, they all begin with the letter S. Science, the ability to measure impact, prove returns, and make better decisions. Substance, not just communicating, but actually shaping the substance of the business and delivering consistent value to ever more demanding customers. Story, creating stories across all channels that engage customers and inspire them to share these stories across networks. Speed, being able to adapt and take action quickly and then simplicity, enabling organizations to move at the required pace of marketing. Being good at one or two isn't enough. We need all three to, to thrive, all five to thrive. 
Let's turn to science and start with a quote um, from Lorraine Tuhill, the senior VP of marketing at Google, who I had the pleasure of interviewing, and our, the interview is published on McKinsey Quarterly um, website. The beauty of marketing today is that we can really show the return. The data allows us to demonstrate impact in a much more transparent way in the past. Great quote. Let me hand over to Jesko. Yeah, thanks, Jonathan, and welcome uh, from my side. Um, let's start uh, with science. So when we talk about science, it's important that we're not purely talking about data, but we're talking about how can we really derive better decisions with science to create marketing impact. And if I just may start with a simple example, if you take the overall global uh, spend on advertising, and you would just assume that with better analytics you can improve 15 to 20 percent, this would come with an opportunity of 200 billion uh, US dollar. And you might say the consultants throw around big numbers, then just half the number, and you would still end uh, up with a huge opportunity. So the amount of opportunities is really significant by uh, using science to leverage marketing decisions. And let's get into some specific examples. So, I mean, everybody believes that retail is, of course, an example where science is already well established in many companies. Here is an example of a retail company which has previously used classical direct mail based on yeah, simple generic segmentations, and they now uh, use regression and clustering based on a transaction pricing uh, history with some sophisticated predictive modeling based on more than 100 million campaigns per year they touched 2 million customers uh, and 10 million transactions, and based on this intelligent segmentation, they increased the average profit of the promotional products by up to 288%, and that's just one out of many, many examples. Uh, let me give a second one, which is probably hey, more... Yes, go. Yes, go. This is Bar, uh, the moderator. I've just got a <clears throat> question that came in uh, I wanted to ask now. Uh, this question is around there's so many sources of data and so many technologies and tools out there. What is the best way to manage that so that uh, you know, marketers aren't burdened by all the tools, but it can actually make better decisions? Yeah, I would almost quote Jonathan and almost uh, with that hand over to Jonathan with the uh, answer because, I mean, uh, he would always say, um, start answering what kind of decisions do you really want to take. Um, and if you have the answer on what decisions do you really want to take, uh, you should really start structuring the available A sources of data, but then B also tools and technologies which will enable uh, to take those decisions. Typically, unfortunately, you see it the other way around. Uh, many companies start the discussions with huge IT systems and an impossible amount of big, big data, uh, but then uh, you're almost losing uh, uh, total control because you're not even knowing which kind of decisions you want to answer. Great, thank you. Let's come to, let's come to a second uh, example, which may even be a little bit more intriguing because it's not the classical retail uh, example. So this is an industrial player. The player had a large, highly fragmented product portfolio with more than 500 SKUs. As a result, the prices varied widely even for the same product, which of course increased huge room uh, for, uh, or gave huge room to increase the prices, but it was of course very difficult to capture uh, this. An analytical tool was then developed that pinpointed new price drivers and reduced customer segments and actually recommended new prices. And that led to uh, the fact that 1.3 million transactions were scanned uh, and systematically uh, uh, incremental value of products uh, were identified. And as a result, uh, the company reset 100,000 prices for more than 150 SKUs, which of course uh, led to a significant return uh, on sales. But actually, let's not only come to sophisticated data analysis, let's also come to something funny. Uh, so let's try uh, all uh, to listen to the following video.
a chicken uh, teach us uh, about science? Actually, um, it can teach us a lot because uh, the opportunities uh, which we are currently having in measuring impact of marketing are op also sometimes even pretty simple. If you see this video, which many of you may have seen, you uh, end up with a view share rate of 7.8%, uh, which is 0, 0 0.2 euro cents, which is actually even better than the benchmark so far, which was the VW Force video. But what is even more interesting, if you are, let's say, sitting around your computer and would now type in Jaguar and um, chicken, so Jaguar and chicken, so the other uh, premium automotive uh, car, you could see a second video with a chicken. Uh, and actually, when I give speeches, I show both videos and ask then the audience, which video do you like more? And many actually like the Jaguar video more because uh, a cat is at the end of the day hurting the chicken and then the Jaguar comes. Uh, but interestingly, uh, the success of this video was one-third of the Mercedes video, if you look to the numbers. Um, so there are also, and that's the main message here, very simple uh, degrees of how to measure uh, impact of marketing with science. Finally, yes, so, yes so we have an, another question there. I just wanted to jump in. <clears throat> a few questions on this topic around data quality, right? So a lot of what you're talking about really depends on excellent data quality to get the insights and the decisions um, that would really help drive, uh, you know, drive better marketing. H how do you ensure that the quality uh, of the data itself is good? Yeah, I would, uh, again, uh, start with, let's say, almost the same answer uh, than I gave before, Bar. So, so uh, and, and sorry for maybe being a little bit flappy on that one. I would really say learn to drive before you fly. So. The, the difficulty here, Bar, is that we try to use so many data and then, of course, the quality simply can't be good enough because then you use augmenting techniques to combine data sources. Of course, you get lots of mistakes. So my guidance or our guidance would actually really be, again, start with the decisions and start with a very, let's say, limited set of the data you really want to have. And if you just take this one, it's a simple uh, measurement uh, uh, on effectiveness of campaigns uh, in the Internet, which is easy to get and which is actually very accurate. And then, of course, you will build step by step your data mart within the company by adding one source after the others. There are lots of experts who will actually uh, uh, enable this data mart and who would make sure that the quality of the data is sufficient. But the biggest mistake one can take is really to allow too many sources uh, to come in that data mart. Yeah, just one thing I'd add to that, Bar. It's a good question on the whole um, data quality question. My, my um, assessment here is that we can't make um, the perfect the enemy of the good. And um, in many instances, you know, we can accept a standard of data um, recognizing that we're going to get an answer that is roughly right. And I think that that is, in many instances, uh, completely acceptable. And you know, we can use triangulation of sources to take different angles to see if different analyses, bottom up or top down, um, confer. But I think, generally speaking, we, we 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 would earn the side of you know, go for the roughly right answer, as opposed to risking the precisely wrong answer. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great Thank point. Thank you. So let me uh, wrap the science uh, uh, topic up. Um, of course, some of you might ask, uh, it's all nice, but is science at some point really even destroying our creativity, which we desperately need to have in marketing? From our standpoint, it's actually uh, the wrong debate. Uh, and actually, uh, combining the necessary art, uh, so creativity in marketing, which is absolutely crucial for, for let's say, as really driving growth, combined with the science I was just mentioning too, is even also the wrong answer. Because in our view, uh, uh, good marketing or great marketing is really a combination of, of three elements, which is uh, art, which is science, and which is actually craft. So making things happen. And especially in large uh, organizations, you finally have great concepts developed on sophisticated science, but then things are not moving because they get not implemented. So therefore, we are only focusing on art, science, and craft in the combination. But 
let's move uh, to the next topic uh, on substance and let me, before handing over to Jonathan, kick it off. I had the opportunity to talk to Ola Kalenius, board member uh, of uh, Daimler, uh, what he would have said on substance. Look what luxury brands are doing. They are building flagship stores that are beautiful, where you actually like to just browse around before you buy. Those are emotional places. So, Jonathan, what do we think about science, uh, about substance? I love that quote from Ola. I think it's just spot on. Um, let's talk about substance. The sort of sub, uh, insights that are emerging from the marketing science that Jesko's just taken through, through, whether that's data analytics or consumer insight, have the power not just to shape better marketing communications, these insights have the power to shape the substance of the business. And this, we believe, is really, really key. There's been a view in the past that great advertising can sell a Me Too brand, and we just don't believe that's true anymore. The substance of the value proposition is absolutely important. And marketing, who are listening to the voice of the customer, are in the best position to infuse the corporation about customer needs and desires. And that, in turn, can drive better products, better services, and better experiences. And that's critical because, as we all know, transparency has raised expectations across the board. Just take a couple of categories. In automotive, um, the, the premium car manufacturers have been first to roll out sensor technologies, which combined with onboard computing, have put very sophisticated safety systems as part of the manufacturer offerings. The expectation, and in fact it's happening, those are now rolling off, out across mass uh, cars wells. It's not just staying with, lu with luxury. In clothing, brands like H&M, Topshop, Uniqlo, and Zara have responded to the consumer's desire, frankly, to have it all. They bring the colors, fabrics, and designs of high fashion, and they do it at mass market prices. Amazon's another great example. They've set a high bar in user experience and delivery expectations, and this in turn has set the consumer expectations across all the businesses. And this is a really important point, which is, any company may be happy with its individual app that's appearing on, on, the, on their uh, consumer's iPhones, but consumers will be judging that not whether it's the same as other apps in that business category. They'll be comparing it with all the other apps that are on their phone. So it's not just good enough to be as good as your competitors, but are you at the bar that's being set more broadly um, across all consumer um, interfaces? One area which we believe marketers have a, can have a big amp impact is shaping customer experiences. And here's just two examples that we like. Um, the first is Mercedes, again. Marketing has taken a leadership role here in designing and setting standards for Daimler's uh, digital customer experience brand. It's called Mercedes Me. Uh, it's an impressive digital platform, and it provides customers with a bunch of stuff, access to maintenance data from their cars that actually is coming from sensor-enabled diagnostics that are delivered um, remotely, automated appointment booking um, for servicing and, and warranty uh, checkups, personalized financing, and even quick access to Daimler's car sharing and taxi services. Quite impressive. Another example comes um, from energy. Um, European energy has been deregulated, and what's happened is that marketing has become fundamental to the success of this uh, industry. In this particular example, marketing led the changes on customer onboarding and reduced it from seven steps to two steps. Costs reduced by about 40 to 50%, Complaints dropped, and with it, the number of people required to handle those complaints. Marketing not only drove changes in the way the business was being communicated, it drove change within the company. And these are just two examples of where marketing is not just leading the communications, but is changing the substance of the business. Hey, Jonathan, I've got a, a qu number of questions on a topic I wanted to jump in on around the substance. You know, we're talking about those uh, different areas where you engage with the customer and form that kind of emotional connection. How, how do marketers think about, you know, weighing customer experience versus differentiation versus the product? Um, so the first thing is, you know, we, we, we tend to think of these things in two buckets, which is we think of these what we would call the antis, and we think of these in terms of the drivers. So let me just tell you what I think those are. Antis are the um, competitive minimums that you have to be successful in any in any business, so you know a car needs to operate in cold temperatures. Um, the uh, a car needs to be you know reliable. 
uh, those will be considered as antis. And then there will be drivers, things that differentiate the, um, the brand, which can be product antis, so it, its acceleration is faster. They can be service antis, which is they offer the best um, um, wa warranty package and the best um, uh, servicing offers, or they can be uh, customer experience offers so that um, there's, a, there's a, a variety of good services and customer experiences around the product that are better. And through uh, pretty targeted research, you're able to isolate what are the, the antis that we need to be delivering to meet competitive minimums, and then what are the areas that our brand can excel and differentiate versus, for, for, versus our competitive set, what we would call the drivers. Super, thanks. Now, Roy, you've said something that is just a little bit more than just the, but let's be clear, we really believe that um, the science of research can really start to isolate the attribute priorities for a brand. But there's something more than just the picking your attributes. And this is this area of story. Um, I'm going to quote Lorraine again. Um, I love this quote. It's not all data. If you fall down on the art, if you fail on the messaging and storytelling, all those tools will get you are a lot of bad impressions. Couldn't agree more with that. Um, the notion of storytelling within marketing is not new, so we're not pretending it is. Um, but what makes a good, what, what, um, how storytelling happens has actually fundamentally changed. You know, in the past, um, all storytelling was pretty much one way. Marketers spoke, consumers listened, or not. Um, new storytelling involves the consumer. Marketers publish, consumers engage, or not. And if they like it, they share. Also, by the way, if they don't like it, they share that too, and marketers respond. It's much more of a, a sort of a, a storytelling ecosystem. Let's talk about two examples. Um, the first one is, um, I'm not sure many of you have seen this, it's Chanel number no. five, and it's You're the One That I Want. It's a film that was, that was, that was uh, released online. Chanel did it directly with the um, director, Baz Luhrmann, and it tells basically a, a story of romance and there's multiple story levels in this. It's worth having a click online. You will join one of the 10 million or more consumers that have clicked on this and watched it. There's the story of, of the characters in the film and their romance. There's the story of the actors. Giselle is in it. There's also, for Game of Thrones uh, watchers, the recast Dario appears in it as the, as the male lead. And then there's a singer in it, a guy called Lo Fang, who sings a very um, alternate and new version of the Grease song, You're the One That I Want. So there's plenty of story in it. And then, by the way, if you click, you can see Baz Luhrmann talking about it, and he explains that the, the song, You're the One That I Want, is really the characterization of how Karl Lagerfeld plays in Chanel. He takes something classic, and he puts a twist on it that makes it seem new and different. It's a great example of where storytelling elevated the brand above just simply the promise to something more and emotional. Um, beyond the, sort of the beauty example here in Chanel, Many of you may have seen uh, the P&G um, sponsorship of the um, Olympics. Now, sponsorship is often can be as simple as, you know, P&G sponsors the Olympics. In this, they did something quite different. They had P&G proud sponsor of moms, and they had this commercial, which essentially dra dra dramatized um, m the role of moms behind the scenes with their children as they developed from young athletes to Olympians, and with the notion of pick them back up was the, was the theme. Um, I've talked to many of my friends, anyone with children, most people would say that they tear up in this commercial. And then behind it, you get a, a, a little um, storytelling and vignette of moms talking about what it was like raising the future Olympian. Very emotional, great storytelling. And again, this is something that's got millions of, um, of, of, of clicks and views and has also been credited with driving significant business for the corporation. So these are just two examples. We could go on. There's many, many more. There's a great example in Google of Dear Sophie, which is another one that we, that, that we love, another real story. But great storytelling is key. It elevates brands and enables them to break through the clutter. And in today's overstimulated world, this is essential. Jessica, why don't we turn and talk about speed? Uh, Jonathan and Jessica, maybe before we jump in, they've got a, a number of questions here um, about you know, how applicable these uh, these points are in the B2B world. Um, I know we had that example, Yesco, earlier about pricing. 
um, in terms of science. But can you talk a little bit about? I know that's not your your your, your area. You generally serve B two C uh, clients, but can you talk a little bit about how applicable this thinking is to B two B companies? You are referring, Bo, specifically to the story part or also to the substance part? Because the substance part, I would say, uh, is actually highly uh, uh, applicable for B2B companies because also B2B companies heavily think, and I'm serving lots of B2B companies, think in, in um, uh, consecutive uh, customer journeys really thought through end-to-end. Um, they do it actually as B2C companies. On the story part, of course, let's say the amount of creativity and actually the, the amount of money uh, spent uh, is probably more limited. But the ways how to communicate uh, with your target audience, which of course then will be customers um, um, or even multi-level communication, uh, uh, will be actually a little bit following the same rules because uh, you are also... Uh, having multiple channels uh, in the B2B world, which you haven't had before. I don't know, Jonathan, whether you want to add anything. But that's yeah, I mean, I, 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 um, the only observation I would have is that I think the notion of um, storytelling is, is clearly going to be different in the B2B world. But I do think the creation of, of vignettes, uh, language that's particularly um, re- works particularly well, you know, ways to engage a B2B customer on a particular topic, all those things are relevant, the importance of language, the importance of anecdotes, the importance of story. Um, obviously, it doesn't uh, result in, 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 you know, things like the Chanel Number no. Five commercial. But I think the notion of storytelling is still relevant. I would almost even uh, provocative say, Jonathan, that the uh, relative potential, actually, almost on all the elements, uh, but at, also on story, might even be somewhat higher in B two B at some point, Fair which point. may sound ridiculous. But uh, as, of course, the level of excellence is in the classical hardcore consumer world much higher uh, uh, or much stronger, uh, you can really, really get a huge differentiation by, by applying some of those ideas also in the B2B world. And I'm serving, I would say, 60 to 70% my time really B2B companies, of course, most of them with a little B2C uh, uh, lack, but also hardcore B2B uh, areas. Yeah. And, and, and a follow-up question on storytelling before we move over to the next section here on speed. Um, good question here about, you know, in today's disruptive digital and connected world, um, how has the nature of storytelling changed? And I think, Jonathan, you teed it up a little bit at the beginning in terms of the, the network effects, but you could do talk a little bit about, you know, storytelling in a disruptive digital world. It's so interesting, which is I wouldn't I wouldn't really use the word as disrupted. I think sort of think of it as connected world. I think there's two components. First of all, storytelling is not one way. It's the point I made in the in the communication, which is earlier, which is you know uh, storytelling. Um, your you engage your uh, users as part of the story. They are amplifiers or detractors as the story kind of gets out there. I think the other component, which I think is something we're going to um, see much more of is the role of consumers independent of the corporation to do the storytelling for you, the notion of user-generated content. And I think we're going to see, in the future at least, more evidence of companies being able to spot that and create platforms for user content so that it's not just, here's a fabulous piece of creative that's being shared, but it's also users' own stories, users' um, own experiences that are being kind of elevated and shared on multiple platforms. So I guess my view in this is that um, you know storytelling is 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 rife um, on, on a digital world and and you know the desire for content and engagement and and just stuff to share is just absolutely key. So I I, I really do think this is kind of the di- digital has just provided a, a level of uh, of um, er- immediacy and a sort of ability to amplify that's you know far in excess of everything we've seen before. Great. So then let me, uh, we are very good in time, let me uh, come to uh, the fourth uh, S, which is speed. And let's again start with a quote.
speed comes from decentralization and creating a local autonomy to take local action. Actually, when you read this, uh, it's hard to contradict. Uh, but honestly, when you think a little bit about your personal situations in your uh, own companies, you might ask yourself, how difficult or easy is this really to implement? Uh, and I think it's, it's actually not very easy to implement, uh, as right as it is. But I mean, there is a culture of urgency uh, coming around, which has really placed emphasis on speed and agility. And I don't know whether you know this movie, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. There is this little girl called Veruca Salt. And out of that, the Veruca Salt doctrine has been created, which is really saying, I want it, I want it now. And that's actually, uh, if you think a little bit about yourself, when you shop over the weekend and in the internet, that's how consumers, be it in B2B, be it in B2C, react. They just want it now. And that also uh, uh, leads to uh, a result of one of our uh, actually surveys, which we made that 33% of survey respondents would say they would be happy with an, let's say, very fast, but uh, even not so effective answer, while only 17% would prefer a great answer, which is slower, which I think is an astonishing uh, result. So what is actually uh, uh, changing? So changing is from batch processing to continuous uh, delivery. So from marketing defined by one or two marketing campaigns uh, pushed out through uh, classical channels, to near continuous series of interactions with customers. Secondly, from command and control to agile. So it's really the end of this is the only way. So from a rigid organizational hierarchy where decisions go through multiple reviews, and I'm sure you know what I'm talking about, to empowered teams on the frontline reactions to customer uh, development. Thirdly, from manual to automated, so the end of I've always done it this way. So as an example, in pricing, from manual set pricing to dynamically generated pricing based on demand, location, time, and whatsoever. And last but not least, from slow development to real-time testing and learning, and that's actually what Jonathan said before, uh, uh, not waiting for the perfect, uh, but also just trying and testing. If we come to two examples, uh, the one, of course, you all know, and I don't want to overquote it also because there are definitely also other companies uh, uh, who are uh, good in, let's say, uh, really fast product development, but one of the examples which uh, are always quoted is really Google. Um, I mean, at Google, lead times for new products are continuously shrinking. Uh, internal teams are attuned to putting products in front of consumers and then bringing back insights in real time and cycle uh, of testing, learning, and iterating. And in that, of course, marketers are absolutely central to this process. Uh, they work to develop close relationships with product development teams in order to inject their knowledge uh, of user needs into how products are developed. And if you just, again, type in your browser in the internet, design sprint Google, you will even learn how Google will teach you to have a, a prototype done in 40 hours. This may not be applicable in all corporate uh, environments, but at least corporate environments may be able to learn from this. And let's maybe go to another example, which I also like a lot, which you also find many details in the internet. It's Nestle, actually. Uh, uh, which is how they really build speed on bringing digital into the company, which is probably a topic relevant for, for many of you. So there was a digital acceleration team, DAT, created with 12 of the highest performers from Nestle, and they actually spent eight months in the headquarter to learn speed projects on digital topics, uh, and then they came back in their local offices, and actually uh, in that they were even doing the same uh, with other groups of people to really spread this whole digital topic in the company like a wildfire. And, I mean, they were spending uh, 1,440 hours of social media listening. They had 130 stakeholders globally in the company in that network. They have a huge uh, number of uh, uh, Facebook likes created. So something really, really meaningful uh, came also out of that. Uh, I really love that example. So let me therefore now come 
to the last topic, which I am very... Uh, Jessica, another question before we move on to this next section. There's an interesting question here about this point of real-time feedback. This question here is about you know, embedded technologies. Uh, the question really is specifically about cars, but I think we could expand it to other areas, too. I think it touches on the Internet of Things, where technologies are interacting with each other to create real-time feedback loops. Uh, what would you and Jonathan say, like, how vital is that information in terms of how marketers are, um, are doing their marketing? I'm not sure whether I fully got the question, uh, how, 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 how vital or how what? How, how vital, how important is this, uh, the, the technologies where various technologies are actually interacting with each other, not interacting with people? in terms of creating these feedback loops um, and more f f like quicker response times to the marketplace? I think it's very important, but Jonathan uh, uh, is also, let's say, expert, more expert than I am in, in automotive. I think it's very important, but again, um, uh, it's, it's one way on how to get that feedback, uh, and I wouldn't really focus on uh, getting that feedback pure, purely on thinking about uh, technology, but again, I would uh, ask the question, what kind of feedback, what kind of insights do we really then get? And then uh, uh, we easily can drill it down to the, let's say, different technologies, which uh, can be very, very sophisticated, actually, but I'm, uh, and sorry for that bar, repeating probably myself here, uh, in many situations I've seen, this whole discussion is driven by technologies. And I, uh, as much as I love the technologies, um, think it's the wrong angle to start the discussion by the technologies, but more by the insights you want to gather. One um, point I'd add on this one um, is the, the, the reality is the speed of feedback, and I think you know the, the stacking up of technologies that are accelerating that means that in many instances the feedback loop is now faster than the ability of businesses to respond. Um, so if you just think of the the, the, the current <clears throat> marketing processes, in many instances, our ability to respond quickly to get acceptable creative out, to get something that's approved through our uh, legal departments um, or uh, public affairs, these processes, I think, um, <clears throat> remain a lot slower than our feedback loops. And I think that the marketers that are distinguishing themselves now are setting up um, organizational structures and processes that can really move at the required pace of marketing. I think actually Yesco is going to talk a little bit about that now as we talk about um, simplicity and some of those organizational enablers that will enable that to happen. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a great uh, handover. And honestly, I'm probably too honest here, uh, but. I think this is, at least for me personally, my favorite one, um, but it's probably also the one where actually we, uh, at least I would invite all of you to also contribute to the discussion uh, and actually uh, come up with more and more uh, uh, solutions how to overcome the huge complexity in which we are. Because I think we are all sitting in the same boat. We want to promote marketing uh, uh, as one of the most relevant functions, corporate functions, actually. But if you then, on the other hand, see uh, how the average duration of a CMO in a corporation is, a little bit more than two years, you're almost asking yourself the question, is it because all of us marketeers are so stupid, or is maybe the environment just so complex that we're just not able to handle that anymore? And therefore, I love this quote of the growing complexity is unmanageable in-house versus external, established channels versus new channels. We need help to get through this jungle. And you can imagine that, of course, a company who would have told me that uh, I did that interview wouldn't want to get mentioned uh, because then maybe that CMO would have been the next one uh, uh, on the list of, of getting replaced. Uh, so therefore, there is a huge need uh, on overcoming uh, uh, the complexity and a huge need for, for being uh, and creating simplicity. Speed and agility require relentlessly focusing on being simple. And there are various ways, actually, of how companies would do that. So some companies, we haven't mentioned that here on any of the slides, would say there is a, let's say, small set of global standards. Uh, 
uh, those small set of global standards uh, would then uh, uh, actually get uh, almost as, as a joint agreement of this is how we operate to all local entities. But in addition to that, local entities really would have the autonomy uh, to, to act actually as fast as they can, also coming back a little bit to the speed section. Another example, um, uh, actually, uh, which is uh, uh, coming, is about um, a company uh, from, from the telecommunication uh, industry. And I mean, they are facing, as many of the companies, uh, various uh, uh, challenges, like geographic footprints are getting more, product and channel proliferation uh, uh, is coming up. You know all that, digital and technology specialization, hierarchy, silos, I mean, you all name it, and this company actually uh, uh, did uh, something. They actually put customer experience, which was one of the most important uh, issues to focus on, and we mentioned that actually in the substance part, uh, as direct report to the CEO. And with that, of course, uh, they could be able to act as a cross-functional uh, uh, team uh, which was a very, very powerful signal in the whole company and which, of course, able, enabled also this entity uh, to be much faster and actually also much simpler to take decisions simply through that link to the CEO. Of course, you can, of course, not link everything to a CEO. That's also clear. Therefore, one other example, which would be Daimler uh, again, so they reorganized its marketing and sales departments around the idea of best customer experience. Uh, they created a new customer experience function, bundling several headquarters functions into one that maps the entire customer journey. And the goal was really uh, to look into a consistent brand experience throughout the world. And again, uh, uh, there are other ways on how to uh, overcome this problem. And as I'm open and honestly saying, I don't think there is a perfect solution out, but I think that the topic of simplicity will be something uh, which will actually be uh, uh, one of our most important topics over the next years. That's why it is our fifth S. But before we sum it up, uh, uh, let me say simple, of course, does not mean simplistic. Sometimes it's really mixed up. If I give you some examples, Simple does, of course, not mean that in terms of communication. Simple is probably also not meaning communicate like this one did for the banana slicer. I actually love that one. It's not a single speech where I wouldn't use that one. And what I most like actually is this one. Well, that's also pretty simple and, and danger at the same time. So simple, again, doesn't mean simplistic. And with that, let's say more funny things, uh, before we come to uh, some meaningful time of discussion, let me sum it up with our five uh, ideas. Science, we say today's insights or yesterday's facts on substance, uh, it's really about the differentiated experience or Me Too selling as a core question. On story, as Jonathan mentioned, making connections or really speaking into the space. On speed, how can we make sure that we are faster than our competitors and not slower? And on simplicity, uh, with an open invitation for all of you guys uh, also to, to come up with, with new ideas. How can we simplify processes or overwhelming uh, us with new things continuously, which probably will make the duration of a, uh, let's say, average CMO even uh, shorter uh, over the next years? So thanks for now, and let's uh, bar, uh, have some questions. Great. Yeah, we have a, a few minutes for some questions here. Um, <clears throat> sorry, there have been so many coming through. Thank you very much for submitting the questions, and apologies we can't get to all of them during this session, but uh, uh, one that just came through, I think for you, yes, could be helpful. Um, the example was around, you know, you just talked about Daimler and reorganizing based on customer journeys. Um, is this becoming more prevalent? Are you seeing examples in other companies where uh, companies are, are using the customer journey and the customer experience as a basis for reorganizing how they work? 
Yes, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm seeing that actually in, uh, in many companies. I'm seeing that in, in energy companies. Um, it's not fully, let's say, embedded in how they structure the departments. But at least before they design departments, they start to consecutively think about end-to-end -end journeys. Because as, as Jonathan said in the substance piece, um, if you mess it up in one piece of the journey today, uh, you simply can't afford it. Uh, because this one piece may be actually killing the whole experience and destroying everything what you did great. That was the aunties and drivers example of Jonathan. So I see many, many companies thinking about end-to-end -end journeys, and I also see some companies also starting to organize in the journeys, which is actually uh, mostly about removing the interfaces, which you typically have, would have seen in corporations. Yeah, I mean, what we know about customer journeys is that, you know, more than half of them um, are, are multi-channel. So, you know, they, it would start potentially online, it could move to a telephone, um, it can move to a, a retail environment. Um, you know, there can be some intermediary involved. There's a lot of multi-channel, multi-touch point journeys. So I think that there, that we're only really beginning to, we're getting insight now on those journeys. I think um, in many instances, we're still working out the right way to organize around those. And in many instances, you know, it, the organization is as much to do with um, not necessarily reorging because, you know, it's never going to be perfect but being clear what, what is the process and handoff that's around a customer journey. Okay, and, and a follow-up actually on that particular point on customer journeys is how do you convince the CEO and the CFO um, to buy in the, into the value of customer journeys? I would actually say, uh, I would maybe give you the, that answer on, on a concrete case. So the, let's say, energy example which Jonathan was mentioning um, was actually building on customer journeys. Um, and typically, uh, I mean, you would start to improve customer journeys uh, by telling the CEO, okay, we need to drastically improve our customer experience, and we can only do that uh, by, by thinking holistically about the customer journey. So then the CEO or the CFO would immediately tell you, yeah, it's a nice idea, my little uh, CMO, but unfortunately, you don't get the money for that because, again, it costs enormously because you invest in customer satisfaction and we never know whether this pays off or not. Interestingly, investing in customer journeys at the end of the day, even which sounds funny but it's true, reduces costs because you would actually focus, this, uh, focus your processes on the core needs of consumers. And by, for example, reducing in energy an onboarding process from 12 steps, which is, which is a huge pain for the consumer, customer, to three steps, kicks out more than 40% of the cost of this uh, process step within that entire journey. So the convincing argument for the CEO is we can do that investing in customer experience and journeys without spending additional money because we even make the processes within the company leaner and smarter. And following up on that point, we have had a number of these questions come in. I, I wanted to hold up until the end. Um, I think ties to your point, Yesco, in terms of how this can have improvement on the bottom line. In terms of, and I think Jonathan, you teed this up at the very beginning of the presentation on data and analytics. Um, how do marketers now know that not only are they, you know, getting lots of hits and retweets and likes, but actually driving growth with their activities that they're doing? And what sort of metrics have you found been uh, most effective in terms of communicating that? So it's um, it's a great question, and I think that the answer to it is that there are a series of, you know, leading and lagging indicators that a marketer needs to have their eye on. Um, and I think that, first of all, we've obviously been through the components of, you know, speed and simplicity, and that's what's going to make these things happen. We've talked then about substance and um, storytelling. The role that science plays throughout this process is pretty key. So there's a set of pre-analyses um, or tests that need to occur as you are going through both uh, concept development 
communications development and ultimately creative execution. And there's a set of very clear leading indicators that can indicate I've got a concept that's testing well, I've got a communication idea that's, that's connecting, and I've got a creative that's likely to cut through. And there is a set of leading indicators and research um, protocols that can give you uh, reads on all of those things. Then once stuff goes to market, then there are a set of um, uh, emergent, uh, sort of, again, they're, they're somewhat leading because they'll be ahead of business results that will tell you you've got something that's, that's of relevance, which can be you know, early offtake, it can be some of the buzz. Um, it may be results that you're getting in a lead market. Um, and then being able to then tie those ultimately through to actual business uplift. So really it's a, a kind of the marketing science goes from before, you know, making sure all those piece parts are looking good, the early signs that it's tracking well, and then obviously the business results. And then really through all of that, there's just this concept that I think we often forget in the speed and pace of marketing is, you know, we're learning things and we have to adapt as we go. And that means, you know, making twists the way we communicate things, repositioning benefits and having that agility to do that as close to real time as possible. The only thing which I uh, w may add here, Bar, is um, whether it is a set of five to seven pragmatic KPIs in light of what Jonathan just said, or whether, like in some companies, it's even a sophisticated um, ROI measurement, uh, which really links to the bottom line, which of course is the S class of the whole thing. I think what is most important is that you agree in your board with your colleagues that this is actually the KPI uh, uh, dashboard which you want to get measured on. Because if we don't define the numbers and the KPIs where we want to get measured on, be sure that someone else will do it for us. Uh, and I think we need to take control about this process here. Great, thank you. We have a couple more minutes. I'll try to squeeze in one or two more questions. Um, you both have touched on um, the role of culture um, in terms of pushing these five S's through. Could you talk a little bit more about what, what the role of culture is to really help marketing and the business actually drive growth through these five S's? Yeah, I I may start quickly. I mean, I can only say it, it, it's, a, it's of huge importance, Bar, it's of huge importance. And therefore, let's also be clear, we talk nicely about the five S's, but of course we know also reality. This is something which is very, very important uh, in, let's say, full excellence to establish in large corporations. I'll give you just one example. We were actually exploring new business opportunities uh, for a client uh, in Europe um, by actually assessing new companies which we might have even then acquired for this company. And after, let's say, all the different processes and steps and, and councils and investment board meetings and the classical corporate, uh, let's say, forums uh, or government and structures, one company after the other, which our team would have explored, was bought from a competitor. And the client would have told you, great job, friends, you have done a great job, you always figured out the nice, uh, let's say, things, but unfortunately we're simply too slow. So I think there is a huge difference bar in terms of are you an agile com uh, company, which is of course uh, more a startup type of company, or, or are you actually born in a, in a large corporation where you simply need to try to test new things, where you simply need to outsource things to external uh, uh, environments, external parties, where you really need to test uh, new things. Otherwise, you can't be able to uh, adapt all these changes so fast that you would need to. For the point on, on culture, I again, agree with absolutely what, what, what Jesko said. And just to really amplify one point in this is most company cultures have biases. And um, if I just take you know, two dimensions. This Some companies are more oriented towards the science of marketing, and some are more oriented towards the story of marketing. And I think in that, it's just, you know, as, you look, as, as, as anyone on the phone is listening to all five of these components, I think there's this question, where is our culture strong? Where do we have real kind of muscle memory and talent and capability? And then where is our culture um, got an opportunity for development? Where, where, where do we see opportunities to improve culture in some of these dimensions? And some of that can be done internally, so we're going to you know, make moves 
um, with talent that we're going to um, advance and import and, and develop. And some of it may be to surround ourselves with third parties that will actually do some of that, um, whether it's science or storytelling for us. Great. Well, I noticed we're at the top of the hour now, so I'm afraid that's all the time we have for today. Um, thank you, Jonathan Yesko, for sharing your uh, insights and stories about marketing's golden age. And I want to particularly thank our audience for joining our session um, and for all these great questions. And again, apologies, we don't have the time to get to all of the questions we got through, but thank you for your interest in sending them through. Um, as a reminder, you can learn more about this topic from the article that Jonathan and Yesko wrote called The Dawn of Marketing's Golden Age. Uh, it's live on McKinsey.com. Um, and I noticed there were a lot of questions about B2B. Um, we have an article that we recently published that also talks about the B2B customer decision journey and how that's changing. Um, but anyway, thank you very much uh, for joining. Thank you again, Jonathan and Yesko. Um, and I think that's all. Goodbye. <laughs>